whatever. Okay, <laughs> we are we are recording. Okay, so tonight we're gonna we're gonna look at another biblical woman uh, through the text of the Bible where she appears in one significant moment, which is told more or less the same way in two different biblical books. And then we're gonna see how her story is told by the rabbis of the classical period, as well as some modern readings. So Huldah the prophet appears in the second book of Kings chapter 22 and the second book of Chronicles chapter 34. Um, while we'll see that later on, there are seven women considered by the rabbis to be a, a Navi or Navia, a prophet, and Miriam is given that title by the Torah, Hulda is the only woman in the period of the kings before the destruction of the first temple and the exile to Babylonia, who is identified by her name as a prophet. She seems to have played a certain kind of public prophetic role, including being consulted by the king as did some of the other non-literary prophets, such as Natan, Eliyahu, and Elisha. So there are prophets who appear in the narrative stories, particularly in the Book of Kings. Um, and then there are prophets who we call the literary prophets. Those are the ones that uh, uh, Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and then the 12 minor ones. And Rabbi Malamud always says, well, his mother didn't think he was minor. But um, uh, so a, a few of them, uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah do actually appear in the book of Kings as well. They make, uh, they make little token appearances, um, but she is not in that category. She's more in the category uh, of Natan, Elijah and Elisha where a story is told about them, okay? Um, before, we, uh, before we read her story, um, I suspect that while some of you have heard her name previously, most of you know very little about Hulda. We're going to see a number of rabbinic texts, but she doesn't seem to have captured too much of the imagination of the rabbis, uh, the way that some of the other biblical women um, that we've studied over the past year or two do. And even more striking, at least in my opinion, she doesn't get the same attention from Jewish feminists and women's studies scholars. She is on the list and she gets a mention here or there in discussions of biblical women, but she often seems to be an afterthought. And yet I'm going to argue that she played a significant role in Jewish textual history and in the transmission of Torah Moshe the Torah of Moses as it moves from an actual written text into a wellspring of interpretation. So let's start by looking at uh, her story in 2 Kings 22, and hopefully this is gonna work. Yes. Oops, so I have to talk to Sherry. Okay. All right, so, um, so this is uh, 2 Kings 22. Um, uh, as you see, the, the Josiah, who's, who's the king at this time, lived from 639 to 609 BCE. And of course, you always have to go, you have to go backwards. So Josiah was one of the great kings in the eyes of the historians who wrote the books of the Bible. He was the great grandson of Hezekiah, another one of the good guys, but he was the grandson of Manasseh, who was one of the top 10 bad ones. Manasseh returned the idols of Baal to the high places, brought the Asherot into the temple of Solomon and shed innocent blood in the streets of Jerusalem. Josiah's father, Ammon, followed Manasseh's ways and he was killed after two years. So eight-year-old Josiah was put on the throne. As a teen, he began a process of purifying the temple and destroying the altars of the high places and the outside worship. And uh, so the first paragraph here from Second Kings describes a, a, a process or a little bit of who Josiah was. And it's interesting that this bunch of kings, we actually get the mother's names. Um, maybe someday I'm gonna follow up on that, um, but there actually isn't a whole lot on those mothers. Um, so, but he was good. And as the, the historian of kings, if you, if you walk like David, then you're a good king. Um, 
and uh, by the kind of the 18th year of this process of cleaning up the temple, um, Shafan, who was one of the scribes, uh, was sent to sent to the temple. How is our money being spent? Right, that's a that's a normal question to ask when you've done uh, great fundraising. Um, and uh, really, it's verse eight where it starts to get interesting in the sense of setting us up to meet Hulda. Right, so Chilkia, the high priest, said unto Shafan the scribe, "I have found this book of the law, Sefer Hatoraz, the Hebrew there, in the house of the Lord." And Hilkiah uh, delivered the book to Shaphan as he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought, brought word back to the king and said, your servants have poured out the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hands of the workmen, blah, 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 verse 10. And Shaphan the scribe told the king saying, Hilkiah, the priest has delivered to me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the book of the law, Divrei Sefer HaTorah, he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Achinoam the son of Shaphan and uh, another group of, of people, um, go inquire of the Lord, the Chu uh, Dirshu et Adonai. So keep that word Dirshu or Doresh in, the, um, in your head for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of the book and do according to all that which is written concerning us. Okay, so that's, um, that's the mission. Uh, a book is found, it's read, something about the reading makes the king go into mourning. And he, he wants to find out more about this book or more what to do, it's not totally clear exactly what he's looking for, okay? But Hilkiah the priest and, uh, and, and Shafan and a, a couple of other guys went to Hulda, now listen to how she's, intro she's introduced, Hulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And the word there is Bamishnah. Okay, hold that word in your mind as well. And they spoke with her. Okay, so they, they, they went to Hulda. The king doesn't seem to have given them a specific assignment of who to go to. Go find, a, go find a prophet for me. Or maybe he did, in fact, let them know who, who they should go talk to. Okay, and she said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man that sent you to me. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon its inhabitants, even all the words of the book at Kol Divrei HaSefer, which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. Now, this is still Hulda speaking. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord thus, you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words of which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse and have rent your clothes and wept before me, I have also heard you, says the Lord, Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Neither shall your eyes see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought word back to the king. Okay. And all right. Um, I'm, I'm willing to try a few. Uh, a few. What, what do you see? What do you hear? What strikes you? What's your, what's your opinion? Just kind of wave your hand and unmute yourself. If you want anything strike anybody any questions jerry yeah so so starting starting at the end and working back well starting starting with where she she starts speaking okay um she immediately comes out with thus says the lord right so one question is was there any breathing time 
uh, had God let her know in advance, they're going to come to you. Here's what I want you to say. You never know with a prophet, you know, God's, God's going to speak to them. Um, so, so that's a question, the timing. Um, what other things caught your attention, Ellen? You have to unmute. It was just the length of the quote, the elaborateness of it, the many different, you know, internal quotations in a bigger quote. Um, right. So when we think of we think of prophets in their books, they go on and on and on. But you're right. In narratives, we often don't get that much information. Yeah. Any other things that catch your attention? Questions, Joanne? Um, what's the difference between the man that sent you to me? and the king of Judah, because from the previous few lines, it seems like it should be one and the same person. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so if so, why does she refer to him that way or those two ways, is there a difference? Uh, and the way that she refers to him is gonna, um, the rabbis are gonna make a point about that. Anything else that catches your attention that you wonder about? If I, if I can do one other. Um, sure. at, at the very end, the, the, the message is back to the king uh, about what's going to happen to the king, whereas the prophecy or, uh, against the country and what's going to happen to the people. Is, right. So, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, it it's, it's devastating. Um, what do we often expect from a prophet? When a prophet yells at you, what does a prophet also often do eventually? Yeah, how, do we, how do we end all our half Torahs in theory? Right, if, if you change, then this will be, be mitigated in, in, in one way or another. Right, so there's, there's no comfort here. There's no, here's what you do to make it better. Here's how you do, you know, the word we use, tshuva, right? Here's what the people can do. Nothing's done. The comfort is you're going to die before you see it. Um, if, if we, um, if we want to read it that way. Okay. So, um, so good. We've laid out, we've laid out um, some of the things there. Did we get everything? Um, yeah, we, we pretty much got most of the things I wanted you to, to, to look at. Um, if you wanted to, you could pull out your Bible and look at the Second Chronicles. It's actually 34. I don't know why I wrote 24. Okay, 34. Um, and uh, while, you, but you don't have to, you know, you, it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> um, it. There were some overall differences between the histories told by Chronicles and the histories told by the Book of Kings. And in this case, there's some overall difference between the, the order of what Josiah did first, what he did second, both before he talks to Huldah and, and after he talks to Huldah or after he sends people to Huldah and, and, and then she comes back. But it's actually remarkably similar, um, what she says and that, that incident, that, that um, paragraph. So that's why I didn't bother, um, I didn't bother putting both onto the, onto the text. Um, before we go ahead um, to look at Hulda in rabbinic texts, um, I actually do have a chance to connect this story with the Passover season. Um, I was trying to figure out why we scheduled so close to Passover when it was something other than Passover. So, so I actually get an opportunity to, to, to give you something to think about for Passover. Chapter 23 of the second book of Kings, which is what happens immediately after this chapter um, tells us that after hearing Huldah's word, Josiah gathers the elders and the people and reads them the entire newly found book. All of the people enter or renew the, con the covenant with God based on what's contained in that book. And there follows a celebration of Pesach as it had not been celebrated since the entrance to the land of Israel. Okay. Um, and, and that's kind of an interesting idea, right? We, we've looked, we, we, we often, Sunday, we had a chance to look at another piece of the history of the Seder, the history of Passover. Um, but there's almost a sense of nobody celebrated Passover. Um, it, it, it just, it sort of wasn't done um, up until this time. Um, and in fact, um, 
The, the Haftorah for the first day of Passover is Joshua celebrating Passover when, the fir, when they first came into the land. And then chapter 23, or at least parts of chapter 23, is the Haftorah we read, we read on the second day of Passover. I'm so always talk about this as being the great Passovers of the past. And then at the end of the holiday, we talk about the great Passovers of the future. But, um, but I had a lot of interesting discussions with rabbinic colleagues today on meetings about um, what happened in Passover in the first temple period. Um, and we, we don't really know, but it's, it's really interesting here. Um, and it does connect, does connect with Hulda, although of course Hulda doesn't appear in the Haftorah and she doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, except of course Chronicles. This is it, that's her biblical, uh, that's her biblical um, time on the stage. I wanna, I wanna do one more digression before we look at, uh, into how the rabbis um, spoke about Hulda. Um, and that the question is, what is this Sefer HaTorah that Hilkiah the high priest said that he had found in the temple, which clearly had such an impact on Josiah? And what were the words in the Sefer which Hulda had a role in authenticating? Uh, Second King says that Chafan the scribe brought the book to the king and read it before the king. When the king heard Divrei Sefer HaTorah, when he heard the words of the Sefer HaTorah, he tore his clothes, which is usually an act of mourning. He sent his advisors, the Chudershu at Adonai, go and inquire of God in, uh, concerning these words. And while I'm not up on the latest biblical scholarship, most scholars um, suggest that the scroll was some part or all of the book of Deuteronomy. As far back as Midrash Haggadot, which is a, a, a medieval Midrash collection, it was taught that when Hilkiah found the scroll in the temple courtyard, it was rolled to the verse, cursed be he who will not uphold the words of the Torah. And this is a text of the first set of curses in Kitavo in Deuteronomy 27. So um, it's, it's, was over this, with it, it seems, was over that, that when you found whatever scroll you found, um, that, um, that it was open to curses, and that that is what made the king tear his clothing and decide that he was trying to fulfill at least some of the cultic commands found in the book. So we, again, we don't know what this book is. Um, I'm not gonna touch the question of how and why a book written by Moshe was apparently hidden or forgotten, or whether Hilkiah or others in the court um, or the temple actually wrote this, what we now call Devarim, to support the changes and centralization of Josiah's reforms. What does Hulda actually do in relation to this book? She says that all the words of the book are true, at least to the extent that the people will be destroyed because they have forsaken God and worshiped other gods. There is of course, much more in Dvarim than ritual and cult and curses. Um, but that seems to be the focus of Hulda's transmission of God's affirmation of why destruction will come, although not in Josiah's lifetime. Okay, let me stop for one minute. Are there, are, are there any questions on, on the, the biblical text and, and kind of the, the, the little bit of um, the little bit of what this text might actually have been in in a historical sense. Oh, what did I do? What did I do? Just uh, <laughs> just mute yourself, Barbara. <laughs> any other any other question or any questions, Susie? Yeah, it seems odd. You know, the so Pesach wasn't observed for all that time. Um, Whenever you have, you know, whenever you're going to be doing something, even if you have to learn about it, it's like not learning it for the first time. It's not like generations have gone by before be, and, and when nobody's done it. And even if you find a book that tells you what to do, that's never the whole story. You know, it's it, so right. it, it, it's like, you know, how did this happen that, you know, for all those years, there wasn't Pesach and then, 
you know, like, how did they know how to shecht? How did they know what, you know, there, there's all these little things that you don't find written in the manual that, you know. Absolutely. That's what makes it so problematic. I'll, I'll be a little fair. I'll read um, verse 22 in chapter 23. Um, now the Passover sacrifice had not been offered in that manner in the days of the chieftains who ruled Israel or during the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Only in the 18th year of King Josiah was such a Passover sacrifice offered in that manner to the Lord in Jerusalem. So it certainly does indicate that there was something, something different related, related to the book. Um, and, and the question of, of, you know, what, is this a radical in, innovation? How could all this be lost? We'll, we'll, we'll actually come back to, we'll cycle around uh, in a modern midrashic sense at the, at the very end. But yeah, it raises a lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions. Um, and I'm sure Morty could, uh, Rabbi Schwartz could also give a, give a lecture on some of the ways it might have been celebrated based on some, some older texts. Was it really home-based? Was it more agricultural-based? Um, whatever it is, this is a radical change. Josiah represents a radical, a radical change, even though he would say, I'm going back to what was. But let's go back to Hulda, because uh, the rabbis actually do some radical things with her too. Um, okay, so, so who was Hulda? Uh, to whom God spoke and to whom religious and secular leaders listened? Hulda, I wasn't quite sure what to call this. She gets about, about half of a page or a third of a page. So Hulda gets a supporting starring role. I don't know if it's, you know, what, what she would get the Oscar for here. Um, on, on one page of Talmud, which will pick up some of the themes related to how she's seen in rabbinic literature. Uh, the Talmud Megillah 14 A and B is part of a collection of rabbinic teachings about women and female characters. In some of our other classes, we've seen some of the things from, from this page and the surrounding pages of the Megillah. Um, the context uh, which allows for this discussion of historical women and some attitudes uh, towards women, uh, this section of the Talmud Megillah um, is about explications of the text of Megillah Esther, where of course the heroine is, uh, is, is Esther. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a couple of pieces from Migilat, uh, from the, the Bavli. Now I'm gonna share, okay. Um, okay. So, um, so it's a little bit chopped till we get to the end of it. Uh, the, the, piece in the, the piece that is connected to or that starts this discussion um, is, is from the Megillah when the king re removed his ring gave it to Haman and Rabbi Abba Bakrahana comments, this removal of the ring was more efficacious than 48 prophets and seven prophetesses who prophesied to Israel. For all these were not able to turn Israel to better courses and the removal of the ring did turn them to better courses. So I'm actually starting, I'm starting out with this because, um, because part of the question when we say Hulda was a, a prophet is what is a prophet? Uh, and what does a prophet do? Um, and, and we also spoke about the fact that she seemed only to affirm destruction. Um, she didn't speak at all about the possibility of change, the possibility of, of tshuva, of repentance, and, and then of God changing God's mind. Um, so Rabbi Arba, Abba Barkahana says, it was only that immediate recognition that they will die that made the Jews of Persia put on sackcloth and they began to, to fast and all those kind of things. And Rabbi Abba Bakahana says all the other prophets, just nobody was really all that effective in changing, in changing Jewish behavior. Um, so um, this, is a, this is a classic uh, teaching. Now, now, there were many more than 48 prophets, but uh, these at least are some of the named prophets. We know that there were bands of prophets, all kinds of other prophets wandering around. Um, and the list of seven prophetesses here is pretty consistent. Um, although, as I said, only Miriam and Hulda are actually called 
prophetesses or prophets, Nivea, in, in the Bible. So who are these women? Sarah, Miriam, Devorah, Hannah, Abigail, Huldah, and Esther. I cut out the part that describes who all the, you know, why each of the other women is called a, a, a Nivea. Um, and I really just want to focus on, on Hulda here. And what we get is a, is a couple of different teachings. Um, number three, the first one, um, Hulda is, is going to raise one issue that the rabbis have with her. Um, Hulda, as it is written. So here's proof that she's a prophetess. So Chilkiah, the priest, and uh, uh, Anakam and Achbar, et cetera, they all, they all went and, and to meet Hulda the prophetess, right? But now they have a problem. If Jeremiah was there, how could she prophesy? Okay, isn't that an obvious question? Well, this is the time that Jeremiah is prophesizing and he does show up occasionally, actually in, in the end of the book of Kings. Uh, the implication seems to be that if there was this important male prophet um, floating around Jerusalem, why would the king go to anyone but the best? And certainly, why would the king or why would the king's um, messengers go to a woman of all things? And where did she get the chutzpah to, uh, to prophesy uh, when Jeremiah was there? Well, it said in the school of Rab, in the name of Rab, um, Hulda was a near relative of Jeremiah and he did not object to her doing so. Okay. Oh, okay. You want to go to my family member? You want to go to my cousin? Fine. Which is interesting, implying that, that it really was Jeremiah's right to have done this prophecy, but okay, my cousin can get it too. All right, but a different answer is given. Uh, the members of the, of the school of Rabbi Sheila replied, because women are tender hearted. Um, this seems to imply, perhaps or suggest, that this was, an, this was a really hard prophecy. This was gonna be really painful, um, but maybe she would have a gentler way to share it. Um, we'll, co we'll come back to that idea a, a little bit later. Rabbi Yochanan said Jeremiah was not there because he'd gone to bring back the 10 tribes. So normally the messengers or the king would have gone to Jeremiah, but he happened to be out of town. So since he's out of town, then they can, then they can go to, um, they can go to, um, to hold up. Okay, we're gonna skip down a little bit, uh, the whole proof text about whether he got the 10 tribes back or not, uh, going to where it says number four. Okay. Um, Rabbi Nachman said, haughtiness does not befit women. There were two haughty women and their names were hateful. One being called a hornet and the other a weasel. Okay, anybody know who the hornet is? Devora. Devora, right. And uh, Hulda is a weasel, right? Of the hornet it is written and she sent and called Balak instead of going to him. Of the weasel, it is written, say to the man, instead of say to the king. So somebody had noticed that before. Um, some of you are on a, a, a class that I did last week for the joint Hadassah and, and, um, Hadassah and, and Sisterhood program about Egyptian women. And I happened to mention that there was, that there was a, a text about the righteous women uh, of that generation redeeming the people from Egypt and said, I was very relieved as a, as a new learner at the seminary to learn that text because I had heard so many other negative rabbinic texts. And certainly this one, um, this one that really is a criticism of Hulda and Dvorah, um, you know, you can't, you can't really be a leader as a female without being kind of unworthy or nasty. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a contemporary issue as well. What is what what are le women leaders allowed to do? But anyway, that that is it. May um, then uh, then the fifth text, which which may sound familiar to some of you who were on another class with me. Uh, Rabbi Nachman said Nachman said Hulda was a descendant of Joshua, as it is written here in connection with Hulda, the son of uh, Harhas. It is written in another place in connection with Joshua, Timnef Harris. Um, 
Rabbi Ein Saba cited the following objection to Rabbi Nachman, eight prophets who were also priests were descended from Rachav the harlot, namely, uh, and then they give a bunch of names, including Jeremiah Hilkiah. Um, Rabbi Judah says Huldah the prophetess was also one of the descendants of Rachav the harlot. We know this because it is written here, the son of Tikva, and it's written elsewhere in connection with Rachav, it, the line Tikva of, of scarlet thread. Um, and uh, then they, they insult each other. And um, we must suppose that Rachav became a proselyte and Joshua married her. But had Joshua any children, it's not written on his son, Joshua's son. He had no sons, but he had daughters. So I'm just going to throw you back to those of you that were on the class about Rachav, um, the, the prophet and mother of, of prophets and priests. Um, so this is, this is the connecting text. Uh, that Huldah, along with Jeremiah, was a descendant of, of, of Rachav, um, who in this Midrash and other Midrashim uh, was actually married to Joshua, a whole nother class. Um, but it's really, um, I think, quite an interesting, um, an interesting piece. Um, I'm actually going to share, keep going for a minute. Um, so as we, as we jump from all of these texts about Huldah that are found in one place, uh, to, to kind of looking at the different texts that are spread around rabbinic um, sources. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a, a, a midrash from Perkei de Rabbi Eliezer, which bothers me a little bit. It's, it's, um, I'll, I'll let you guess why. Um, so the midrash relates that Huldah was gifted with Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of divine inter inspiration, by the merit of her husband, Shalom, the son of Tikva who was one of the outstanding individuals of his generation and who engaged in acts of kindness every day. He would sit at the entrance to the city and would revive any new arrival by giving him a drink from a goatskin of water. According to the rabbis, Shalom, the son of Tikva, is the man of whom the king speaks. After Shalom's death, according to the Midrash, all Israel sought to repay him for his kindness and accompanied him to his grave. When they came there, they saw the legions of Moab and they cast Shalom in the time of Elisha, tomb of Elisha. And upon coming into contact with the latter's bones, Shalom was immediately came back to life. Afterwards, a son was born to Hulda and Shalom named Hananel, Hanamenel, who is the one that's the, the son of Jeremiah's uncle who features uh, in Jeremiah. Um, so it, it may be a bit of my prejudice, but um, uh, you can guess what, what bothers me about this particular midrash is that, uh, is that her Ruach HaKodesh is attributed to her husband's goodness and worthiness. Um, but um, I guess I wouldn't be as bothered by the fact that they just happen to be a spiritual power couple. <laughs> so if both of them are, you know, are, are really the kind of spiritual good, good ones, uh, even entitled to, to um, uh, resurrection, actually, it's one of those resurrection stories. Um, that's okay. But it's, it, it's I, you know, that is on the side of Midrashim, which tend to be a little more negative towards Hulda. She's really more of a, a, you know, she's the beneficiary of somebody else's goodness here. Um, and that is not unusual among rabbinic texts looking at women who, who actually appear as leaders uh, on their own. Um, Excuse me, Stefan? Yeah, sure. So, Jerry. Yeah. So, um, so here they have, uh, is it Shulam who's uh, now derived from Tikva? Um, yeah. It was, it was yeah, both Huda and Jeremiah who were... Uh, yeah, and the question of whether they're all actually related, because this Tikva thing goes, um, you know, goes, goes back and forth, um, because Shulam is actually Jeremiah's uncle, um, so it means they're all kind of they're all kinds of cousins, which is not necessarily surprising either. Um, but yeah, the Tikva there is Tikva, the, the the red string that was used by the that that was used by the spies that that hung out of the window to identify, which connects back to uh, Tamar and Judith, uh, Judah and Perez. And it's all, you know, the more we do these classes, the more we're seeing that they're all connected, right? Um, and we're, and we're, I guess we're all one big family as well. So um, 
so we're we're taught that um, we're taught by Pesita Rabati, another another midrash, that Hulda um, was the during this this generation during this time there were three major prophets. The people were were at least entitled to these three major prophets. Hulda's job was to prophesy to the women. Jeremiah prophesied in the city square, and Zephaniah in the temple. So. Um, so the, the question, right, we know that in the Torah, um, Miriam is, is kind of credited, Miriam the Nivea is credited with leading the women in dancing. Um, and, and the question, a, a lot of the times it seems like her role was more with the women, although in, in, in the prophet Micha, um, we're told that there were three leaders for the Jewish people, Aaron, Moshe, and Miriam, right? Suggesting they were leaders for the whole people. So this question of whether, um, whether she's, um, was Hulda really only for the women, right? Um, perhaps we could imagine a woman being more comfortable coming to a woman prophet um, to, to get the same thing as the king did, Lidroshet Adonai, to kind of inquire with God, get a direct message for God. Um, but I think there's still something in the text which suggests that Hulda had a bigger role in the community than just being the liaison between God and the women. Um, the question of was she really second best to Jeremiah since he was out of town or was something else going on? Um, and we saw a touch of that in the, in, the Talmud, um, in the Talmud suggestion about her tender heart, right? Or women's tender hearts. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that Hulda had a tender heart, but um, so the text doesn't say, the biblical text doesn't say that the king told his ministers to go to Hulda. Um, why did they go to her? Uh, why to her and not Jeremiah if he was in town? Or to Zephaniah, they had another male option. Um, and after all, since the prophets have to say what God tells them to, in one sense, it doesn't really matter which one you go to, to inquire what God wants, because theoretically, God is going to tell the same thing to any prophet in town that day. Um, so perhaps the, the, the minister's hope that there would be something in the tone of her prophecy that would make it more bearable or give the king some hope or guidance. And, and you know, there, there is that, you know, is there that sense that a woman would somehow speak more kindly or more tolerably? Did they, did they have that feeling? Um, and while Hulda confirms the coming destruction, she does offer the king comfort by saying he won't live to, uh, to see it. Now it's not clear that that's a blessing, <laughs> um, and uh, and he actually didn't live very long. Um, he died when he was thirty nine. But whatever it was that Hulda said, or how she said it, or what he heard or didn't hear, Josiah is not paralyzed by how he heard her words. Rather, he reads them to the people, he reaffirms the covenant, and he tries to change the society over which he is king. So it's interesting that Hulda doesn't offer that transformational possibility, at least in, in what we see in her words. And, and yet Josiah continues to act in a transformational way. Um, Hulda is called a Nivea, a prophet, but in a rather surprising set of rabbinic comments, the translators and the rabbis give her a very different kind of role. The phrase or word which catches their attention is, is here's, here's the whole phrase. She lived in the Mishnah in Jerusalem. The Mishnah, right? The, the translation um, that I read said the second quarter, if you kind of kind of picture Jerusalem is often described as being divided into mm -hmm. quarters. So there was the first quarter, the second quarter, right? Maybe that's where she lived. Um, but, but you already know enough Jewish text to know that the rabbis are gonna make more of that word. The Targum, which is the earlier Aramaic translations, translate <laughs> the word as the study hall or academy. The Targum Pseudo Yonatan is even more specific in translating this word Mishnah, right? She, she lived, she, he, he, Evet, she sat in the place of study where she instructed the men in the study 
of law. Um, another view it found in the rabbis is that she taught the Mishnah, right? With a capital M, she, which of course didn't exist then, but she taught the Mishnah, the oral law to the elders of her generation. Another view is that she would preach in public and expound Lidrosh on all the things that are mentioned twice in the Torah, because Mishnah is like Shani, right? Two, twice. That was her. That was her specialty, right? Every every rabbi has their own specialty. Hers was things that are mentioned twice in the Torah. Rashi quotes the tradition that her chamber was as close to the Gazit chamber, open on the outside, but closed in the direction of the Sanhedrin itself, which sat in the Gazit chamber, um, out of a certain kind of modesty. So she is so close to the center of power in rabbinic imagination. Wow. None of this is what I would have expected from the rabbis. First, as they describe her work related to the Mishnah, she is less prophet than a rabbi. Her work is not so much about speaking and transmitting God's word as she heard them, but it is interpreting God's words from a sacred written text. And who was this woman teaching? Perhaps she taught women, but she also taught men and not just men in the street, but the elders and even the Sanhedrin. So, um, so Tikva from um, 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 of blessed memory, um, writes that, um, she kind of evaluates uh, Hulda's role and she, she ties it um, together in a fascinating way. Hulda is a pivotal figure, <clears throat> last prophet in the Deuteronomic history. She provides closure to the period of the occupation of the land introduced by Rachav, her great, 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 great grandmother, to the monarchy proclaimed by Hannah, again, one of the judge, one of the women who's identified as a Nivea and to the throne of David, proclaimed by Avigail, one of David's wives, but also one of the women uh, identified as a prophetess, I think. Um, but she marks not only an end, she is also the beginning of the new phrase of biblical interpretation that becomes even more important in Israel. Like many interpreters who come after her, Hulda is a link, a triangulation point between herself, the words of the book and the world around her. So, um, so it's, it's, um, it's fascinating, right? It's she, uh, the rabbis really take it to a place that you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect. Um, all right, just ignore what I put up for one minute. Okay. Um, but perhaps I was not correct when I said earlier that I think Hulda was ignored, right? After all, if you're familiar with the walls of Jerusalem and the gates of Jerusalem, <clears throat> You will remember, and now I'm back on the text, that there were five gates to the Temple Mount, two gates of Hulda on the south, which were used for both entrance and exit. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it turns out these gates and, and Hulda's legacy um, are, are actually a little more connected than you might have thought. So these are, they're terrible pictures, but, but these are pictures of, of um, from the second temple period near Robinson's Arch, um, near that, that area, the Southern Wall. Um, and, um, and these gates were the public gates by which people would enter the temple area. And you also have, uh, you also have those steps. Turns out Hulda is also buried in Yerushalayim. And, um, and there's a discussion about the fact uh, in, in, in the Tosefta, there's a discussion about the fact that, that normally people wouldn't have been buried within the, the old city, um, but there's a, a grave of the house of David and the grave of Hulda the prophetess were in Jerusalem and not a soul ever disturbed them. Um, and this is proof of the forgiveness attached to them and, um, and it removed impurity from the Kidron Valley. So Hulda, is there, she is remembered. Um, and, and here's a writing that's a, a, 
right, here's another one on this on this idea. The tradition might possibly be connected to who I forget what traditions, but uh, with the Hulda Gate on the Temple Mount, the Tanaim assert that there were five gates to the Mount. We just saw that two of which are known as Hulda Gates. Mm -hmm. The Holy One, blessed be He, took an oath that the Western Wall, the Prince's Priest's Gate, and Hulda's Gate would never be destroyed until He returned them to their former glory. And, and here's an interesting, uh, an interesting teaching that's also going to give us a different idea of the um, of the weasel. Hulda's place in prophecy was in Jerusalem, between the temple's two southern and busiest gates. When the temple was rebuilt, those gates were named after Hulda to commemorate her importance for all generations. Excavations on the second temple uh, site revealed that the gates of Hulda were built directly on top of those where she originally sat. Like her namesake, the weasel, who digs an intricate system of tunnels, linking an entire community, Hulda linked the despair of the first temple's final days to the hopeful new generation of the second temple. So here, Leah Cohn, who I, I don't know exactly who she is, um, she, she reimagines the role of the weasel, right? Rather than being that nasty thing, uh, the weasel digs tunnels that link together communities, which in some ways is what the rabbis do to her as well. Um, it seems that in the biblical story, she is the end on a certain level. She says, you're gonna be destroyed. You're gonna be exiled. You Josiah won't be, but it's okay. And she disappears. Um, but, but both the rabbis and the tunnel, uh, so the rabbis and the, name, the named gates, right, suggest that in fact, like so many women that we don't know much about or more about, um, there is a whole underneath story. Um, there is some traditions and some memory of Hulda uh, as being something much more prominent than, um, than we remember her um, in that one little story. Um, so I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end this and I'll be happy to take, um, to take, questions or comments, uh, where did it go? I'm gonna end this as I, as you may have noticed, I actually end up ending uh, a number of these classes uh, by bringing your attention to Sisters at Sinai by Rabbi Jill Hammer. And uh, it, she does modern midrashim, very scholarly based um, uh, on, on many biblical characters, um, mostly women, uh, some men. And, and the final story um, in this book, so it's kind of the last, the last biblical woman, it, 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 it becomes that transition, um, is called The Words of the Scroll. And uh, this was apparently one of the earlier stories, one of the earlier midrashim um, that she wrote actually for Peter Pitsula. Some of you may know his, his name. Um, he was one of the founders of Bibliodrama. Um, so, um, so Rabbi Hammer creates a story. I love, I love the way this is from her, her comments. Um, so she creates a story in which Hulda is an old woman, is an, an old grumpy kind of, kind of sharp woman, um, is remembering this encounter, um, and remembering the moment that she was asked to, um, asked to authenticate, if you will, um, or, or say, is this text, is this real, right? Because she could have said, this is a forgery. She could have said this, you wrote it, Hilkiah. You wanna, you wanna be the powerful high priest? Forget it, okay? Um, but, but here I love, I love uh, a little bit of what Jill writes. She says, the rabbis may be uncomfortable with uppity women, but I am not. Um, and I love what she does here. As I read this story, I concentrated on its names. Every name of the five-man delegation sent to Hulda is mentioned. One minister is named Akbar, which means mouse. Another is Shafan, which means rabbit. The mouse and the rabbit are going to visit the weasel. It's almost <laughs> like the characters in Aesop's fables. One, sus one has to suspect that Hulda may eat these mild-mannered courtiers if nothing better presents um, itself. Her words are in fact rather sharp. Um, I found in the text, the uppity hulda of the rabbis, a hulda with a weasel's quick bite. I liked her. 
I wondered how she would have made this momentous decision about the scroll. And, and then she talks about her story. Um, and I think one of the things that's so interesting in the story that she creates is that, um, is that she doesn't answer right away. Okay, in the biblical text, it seems like she somehow knows and she answers right away. Uh, but, but Rabbi Hammer imagines her saying, come back tomorrow. Well, actually, come, come back tomorrow. You know, you can almost hear that. Um, and and um, in the story, Hulda spends the day and night walking the streets of Jerusalem because she understands how momentous it is that she's being asked to do this. And she doesn't know. She's not sure. Um, and as she wanders the streets of Jerusalem, she hears a bit of a conversation here, a bit of a conversation there. What do you do with, with um, you're walking and, and there's a bird, a mother bird sitting on the egg. What are you supposed to do? Um, and she hears all kinds of pieces of conversation among the ordinary people in Jerusalem, which suggests that somewhere these parts of the Torah that are found only in Deuteronomy were still being remembered, um, which I think allowed her to say, yes, this is, this is the real thing. This is Torah Moshe. This is, this is God's word. This is not a newly invented text. Um, and, and so Rabbi Hammer imagines her at the end informing the scribe, informing Shafan, whenever you write this text, I am the witness that this is the text which is remembered, and I want you to put a large ayin and a large dalid in the Shema. It's like she hears the Shema, it means aid. If you ever look at a prayer book, and it's certainly if you look in the Torah, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, um, the ayin is big in Shema, and the dalid is big in Echad, that we, that we are witnesses. Um, but the words in the scroll, the word in the words in the scroll, she says, of course, is a meditation on midrash and its place in Revelation. Mm -hmm. If, as the sages say, all of us were at Sinai and all of us heard something different, then Revelation is indeed composed of multiple voices. In fact, we cannot learn Torah without listening to each other. But it is only the prophet who can sort through those voices and come up with a coherent whole. For the rest of us, the study of Torah is mysterious, conflicted, confusing, and endlessly engaging. So I, um, I thank you for joining me uh, on, on yet another endlessly engaging opportunity um, to, to meet our, our biblical mothers, our biblical foremothers, um, and to see how we continue to have conversations with them and with each other. So I'm open to, to questions, comments. Um, yeah, Susie? You have to unmute. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm not bothered by that first text that said, um, you know, that uh, why was she coming when, you know, Yirmiyahu was around? Or right. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that you have to read it that, like, you know, why would they listen to a woman when they had Jeremiah? I mean, there's two things here. Um, Jeremiah was a biggie, all right? So, and she was lesser just because, you know, she was. Um, but on the other hand, um, do we usually have more than one prophet in a generation? Um, so if, if she's coming to say something, you know, it, would, it might be natural, if my assumption is correct, that why should she be prophesying when we've, because we've got the official one, and then it makes sense for Jeremiah to say, no, she's in the family, we're all in this together. Right, so it's, it's interesting because Pasikta Rabati says, this generation got three prophets. Um, you know, Hulda and Jeremiah and, and Zephaniah, they each had their own role. Um, so we know that there were lots of prophets roaming around all the time. Um, I think they overlapped a lot, but, but um, was there, would there have been a most important one? Probably. Um, would the king have chosen the most important one? I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting question, though. I, I, you know, it's just that the rabbi's attitude is, you know, she shouldn't have been the first choice, uh, or they have to explain why. Yeah. If Jeremiah is there, would he have, would he have gone? Would yeah, well, because would Jeremiah, anybody have gone anywhere else, right? Jeremiah is the gazol door, you know, so it makes sense. Right. Right. 
Anyone else? Any Ellen? It's just a question. Is there anything in her rhetoric which indicates either unusual tenderheartedness, i.e. a woman's voice, or anything? I mean, as I read it, this is a, you know, not um, a Jewish Tanakh, but I mean, as I read it, it's the sound of authority of all prophets. I, and and yeah. her rhetoric is right. I mean, so I would never, there's nothing in the, I'm asking, is there anything in her language that indicates I, either I, I don't, or anything I don't else? Think, I don't really think there is. I, I, think, I think that's a text about the rabbi's perception of, of women. And I think, you know, if you read Rabbi Hammer's story and even her comments, there, there's nothing soft about Holda. Um, you know, so this this perception somehow, and and it's interesting now. Like we're we're dealing with this question of what what do women leaders look like? What does this country mean? What's it going to mean that there's this many women in the in the cabinet, um, or this many senators, or um, you know, so that that question of of you know, do we want to say women have bring something different? Do we want to say women don't, right? Believe me, I, I you know, as, as one of the first conservative women rabbis, um, I wanted to be a rabbi, right? I didn't want to be a woman rabbi. Um, I didn't want you to, you know, I, I, the, the early model was, okay, we can have, you know, big daddy rabbis and little, little mommy assistant rabbis. That would be a great model. Um, nobody was ready to think about mommy, you know, big mommy rabbis. And, um, I, you know, so this whole question of, of were women different, weren't they, was a, the, that the rabbi struggling with why she would even have a role there uh, or what would be what would be the, the image? I, I don't sense anything soft in Hulda, um, but, but they're looking for it. They're looking for a reason why she's there. That, that's what I think, why she's gone to. Anyone else, any other, Joanne? It seems curious to me that, that, that they find this book, they read the book, and then the king says, go inquire of the Lord. Like, wasn't the book clear? The book was supposed to be the word of the Lord. So maybe it was, uh, it had something to do with what it was they wanted to know. Maybe it was some information that they thought she might have that nobody, none of the other prophets would have. I don't know what that would be. But. I, I think it's, I think, yeah, I think it's clear that it's not clear what they're what they're looking for. On on the other hand, um, on the other hand, suddenly a scroll is found and nobody seems to know the contents, mm -hmm. and yet it claims to be the fifth book of the Torah, and it has very different rules. I remember, Deuteronomy is the only one that focuses on go worship in the place that I will show you, in the place that I will show you, in the place that I will show you, right? Um, it's a retelling of the Torah, but it has some very, very different things. So suddenly this scroll shows up um, and on one hand, the king is immediately moved by it. And the other, you know, he rents his clothes immediately. Um, it, 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 there's something about it and yet, and yet it doesn't, he needs it to be authenticated. He needs it to be validated by somebody outside of the temple system, right? Because Hilkiah, the high priest, says, "Hey, look what I found." Um, and and while Josiah is cleaning the temple, purifying the temple, rebuilding the temple, focused on the temple, maybe it's too good to be true. You know, at Lahavdi, Lahavdi, the this latest accusation, accusation that Cuomo was trying to get people to write letters and testify, you know, and, uh, you know, so we know that people in power can sometimes create documents without my knowing the answer or the story or what's true there anyway. But, but uh, you know, and I think he felt the need for an outside authority or an outside accounting. And who better than somebody who was known to have a direct line to God? which high priests don't actually have, right? And kings don't usually get. Um, God, has a, God has a category of people that God speaks to. So that's, that I think is why they needed the, 
the, the authentication. Because it was so different, right? That's what's, what's going to be interesting with the newest pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls that have been mm. found. Are they, you know, I, first of all, are they forgeries? Um, but, but second of all, are they going to offer something that we didn't know before? And how is that going to change our understanding? Is that helpful? Anyone else? Anything, anything else? I so, guess, yeah. I guess that's it. Before we leave, let me just uh, preview of coming attractions here. I'm going to share the screen for a moment. Um, so starting with the most, uh, uh, with <laughs> the closest one, uh, this uh, Motzei Shabbat, Saturday night at 8 o'clock, right after Abdullah, um, David Goldfarb will give the second part of his Gilgul Funanigun, which is how, how some of the tunes we know, how did, how did they come to be? Were they related to other things? Were they, were they stolen from other things? Were they from other cultures that came in? Uh, how, did, how, did, how did they, as he says, transmigration stories? And then, so that's uh, coming up uh, this Saturday night, Motzei Shabbat. And then just to continue uh, Rabbi Dickstein's series, uh, we have a break over Pesach and then April 14th and April uh, 21st, Rabbi Dickstein continues her series. So uh, I hope everybody is here for as much of this as they can, as, as they possibly can attend. Um, so uh, thanks. Thanks to Rabbi Dickstein for, for teaching as she so often does uh, in, in such a beautiful way. And as Easton Pesach to everyone if, and happy yes. cleaning and whatever else you're whatever else you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought Thank you. that when I signed up for it, that Stephanie's second one was April 7th. Yeah. So we we somehow all of us, Linda and, and Beth and me and Jerry, all missed the fact that April 7th is Yom HaShoah. Like the evening oh, of Yom Hashoah. April 14th, there's a Hadassah meeting that I wanted to go to. So, so, so we might, if, if recording actually works on this, uh, and I've been writing out my scripts, in case you couldn't tell, because otherwise <laughs> I could do the Zoom thing. Um, so I'm happy to share if you need, if, if you want that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we, 